As we come to God's word, let's come to him in prayer for the blessing of his spirit's ministry. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for coming to us in so many ways, creating us, coming to us even in our sin and brokenness when we turned from our creator, coming to us in Christ Jesus, person and in rule and in might, and Holy Spirit pouring out into us the love of God, the faith that we receive so that we might come, and then also, Lord, coming to us through word and sacrament in fellowship, continually feeding us on your word. We pray, Lord, that uh, this evening, too, you may bless us with your presence, that as we read and reflect on your word and the life of church and pastor, that, Lord, you may continue to lead and guide us in the ways that you would have us go. For your honor and glory, in Jesus' name, and God's people say, amen. If you want to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, there's some of the verses from this chapter, verses 8 to 10 and the 19 to 22. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And then down to verse 19. And consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. We've had a lot of pastors here this Sunday. I don't think uh, someone was saying we weren't sure how many we've ever had in one room before like that on a Sunday morning, but I think I can speak uh, for all of them to some degree that it is an honor and blessing to be a part of the journey of Trinity Christian Reform Church uh, throughout the years. The relationship between a pastor and a congregation is uh, a unique one among all the many different organizational relationships that go on in life. There's many different relationships that are similar, but it is somewhat unique. I can recall my first years as pastor, which took place here in Trinity, uh, sitting down with my then mentor, because I was a student first and then starting out in ministry, you got assigned a mentor, and it was Reverend Cecil Van Eenhuis, and uh, talking to him, especially in the first year, uh, every month we would meet together, talking about what a strange, weird job this is, being a pastor. And then getting his coaching about uh, the glass bubble effect, you're kind of under the spotlights, and about being a flashpoint or a lightning rod for congregational struggles and so forth. Uh, He was indispensable for me. Well, since those years, um, I've learned a few things about congregational systems. I've been in ministry for 21 years. About uh, functional and dysfunctional ways that groups of people interact about the impact of a group's collective history and the place of intentional ministry vision amidst default ways of behaving. I served five years plus a student year here in Trinity, 12 years in Abbotsford, B.C., and now just just shy of five years in Fenwick, Ontario. And this has given me some measure of experience in different parts of Canada and some thoughts about the relationships between pastors and congregations. Now, I'm not an expert in this, and I've not done any big research project on this at all, but I've gleaned this sort of anecdotally from my own experience and from interactions with pastors across many different denominations, being part of ministerials in different towns, and uh, just reflecting on what I see going on in churches in North America. So uh, take it for what it's worth. Now, we pastors know 
that congregations talk about their pastors when they're not in the room. Yeah, we know. We know. Well, I want to let you know that pastors talk about their congregations when they're away from them as well. Ha <laughs> ha. We compare notes. We identify types of persons in the congregation that we would willingly clone so that we could have four or five of them. And a few were willing to trade to another team for a future draft pick. Well, out of many such conversations with other pastors and within congregations, this evening I want to spend a little bit of time reflecting on five lies or five temptations that are often in the mix of a pastor-congregation relationship with respect to the church's ministry. Now, I'm sure there's probably more, or you might think of different ways of looking at this, or you might disagree with this altogether. Or it may be you're saying, this doesn't happen here, we're doing really great, it's all fine, you can disagree with me, because one of the freedoms of being a visiting pastor is to be able to say what you want and go home. But our framework for these are the verses we read from Ephesians 3. So, Now Ephesians, or Ephesians 2, sorry. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, that was one of those core passages in the Reformed perspective on the Christian faith. It's by grace we are saved, and this is not our doing. That's at the heart of all, all that we believe. But what does that mean for a pastor and a congregation in their unique, unique relationships together? Well, here are five lies that pastors and congregations are often tempted to believe. So, lie number one. The pastor is tempted to work as if, and maybe even come to believe that, ministry success in his or her church is up to them. It's all up to them. That means, of course, thinking that when things are going well, I'm doing great, I'm doing great work, I did this. Thank you, God, for letting me do this. It also means when things are going poorly, it's all my fault. I'm messing this all up. I'm failing. That's the pastor's temptation. The congregational side of this temptation, this lie, is to believe that the church's ministry all hinges on the quality of the pastor. Pastors get looked at, looked upon as the hope for the future of a congregation. Now, I don't recall what your last work ad for a pastor looked like. I don't know what the, how they phrased it. But if you scroll through a lot of pastoral search ads today, churches describe their hope for next pastor with the words like this. We're looking for someone who's passionate, energetic, inspiring, dedicated, tireless, creative, lover of our traditions, and a few new things we'll give them permission for, able to teach, to work with the elderly, the youth, with infants and newcomers and wayward persons, uh, will nurture us and challenge us and protect us and keep us and make their face shine upon... Well, you get the idea, right? Some churches really do believe they're in need of a superhero to save the day for them. And they believe that this role, this is the role of their pastor. It's all up to the pastor, so long as they do what we want. That's lie number one. Lie number two that tempts pastors and congregations is this. The mess in our lives is the responsibility of the pastor to fix. The mess in our lives is the responsibility of the pastor to fix. The temptation is to believe that the pastor can fix what's wrong in my relationships, in my life, can fix me somehow. And pastors get drawn into this as they go deeper sometimes and deeper into therapy sessions with congregants way over their head in this, or they're running long-term counseling sessions with parishioners. Congregations view their pastor as their own personal life coach or their resident spiritual PSW, personal service worker. And so they should be able to fix the relationship problems, the family feuds, the polarization, the bratty kids, my confused teens, my cranky old father, whatever it might be. They should be able to fix it. That's lie number two. The mess in our lives is for the pastor to fix. Lie number three. Pastors and congregations are tempted to view the role of the pastor as jack of all trades and master of all of them. Or at least they should be striving for that. Now, pastors get tempted to be doing as much as possible in as many areas as possible in church life. And that their ministry success is measured by doing great in all areas. 
And pastors beat themselves up at this, at failing to do this. Congregations get tempted to believe that busyness, massive amounts of time and activity are the measure of a successful pastor. It even becomes bragging material with other churches. You should see how many hours our pastor puts in. 80 plus, and he's not even tired. That's lie number three. Lie number four, this is the one flows from engaging and accepting the other three lies. Number four, the pastor's work is of the highest priority for the life of the church, perhaps even the highest priority in God's eyes. For pastors, the temptation is to believe in one's own self-importance, that in ministry we are indispensable, that we are indispensable to God in his church. After all, I have a calling from God myself. Therefore, I am very important above most, if not all others in the flock. And for congregations, this lie produces the view that what the pastor does in ministry is of higher importance and value than what any other member does in ministry. It's almost as if we at times believe that God has lifted the pastor above the flock to stand in the breach as her rescuer. When the pastor prays, it somehow means more than when another person prays. You know, we attend an anniversary or a wedding. Pastor, it's a whole wedding full of a crowd of Christian people. Pastor, could you pray for the meal? It'll save it somehow. Five people visit a shut-in, but they they have not really been visited yet until the pastor comes. You kind of know that picture. These four lies tempt us. Everything for the future of the church hinges on the pastor. The pastor is the answer to the mess in our lives. The pastor can do anything and everything. The busier, the better. And the pastor is the most important person in the ministry of the church. Now, these four lies are all forms of the fifth lie, which is as follows. This is my church. This is my church. This church here that I belong to, this is my church. I'm a pastor at my church. You should meet our pastor at our church. The church belongs to us. Not only does Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 move in the opposite direction from these words, so do Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens. You are fellow citizens with God's possessive, God's people, and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets of God, with Christ Jesus himself as the director, the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built by God together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Let me restate this, restate this Ephesians passage to highlight this even more. You are saved by God's grace. He did that for you, not by your own work. That's why you are no longer apart from each other, but are alongside each other as equals with all of God's people, because you are all together. All of us are welcomed guests in God's house. It's not yours. It's not ours. God built his household on the foundation of his word, his promises, made in Jesus Christ, who is the direction-giving cornerstone. Everything rises and depends on him. The church holds together in Jesus. The church grows and is faithful in Jesus. That's into whom we are being built by God. He is forming us to be his dwelling as he is present by his spirit in his body, the church. The Old Testament would say it this way. The Lord God is a jealous God. And that's not envy, it's the traditional word of jealous, possessive. The Lord God possesses his people, he wants them as his own. They belong to him, body and soul, in life and in death. You see, a church's pastor is not a superhero, it's not your fix-everything, do-anything genius who is the most important person at the top of the pile. Those kind of lies whether believed by a pastor or a congregation, lead to nothing but heartache, burnout, frustration, and disappointment. 
No, the pastor is one who has been set in place as one of the many of the Lord's servant members of his body whose calling is to point to the real hero, to the one who can fix the mess in our lives, to the one who is able to do everything, master of everything, to the one whose work is of the highest priority in all of creation. We pastors point congregations not to ourselves, but to Jesus, because that's also who we are seeking, Jesus. So when we preach, we together, pastors and congregations, listen together for the voice of the Lord speaking to us individually and collectively. We listen to God speaking by his Spirit. That's why we pray a prayer of illumination or a a prayer of preparation, whatever you might call it, praying, Lord, take what is offered, use it in the way you would have it used. When we visit and talk together, we are listening together to what the Spirit is saying to all of us through our conversations. Pastors are never coming in a visit as a one-way conversation, bringing God to you, but welcoming God into the presence, and we are all listening. When pastors explore a new direction or a ministry idea or a suggestion with a congregation, we do not hand you a plan from God, but place in our collective midst an idea or a proposal that needs to be graciously examined by all of us together, tested by all of us together, explored by all, maybe tried out and failed and learned from together. And why? Because it's not our church. It's the Lord's church. It's his ministry. It's not our agenda. It's not our egos, our pride, or our desires. None of that is the point. It is the Lord. Echoing what Pastor Fred preached this morning, it's not about you. And it's not about the pastor. It's about the Lord. Because it's not our church. It's not the pastor's church. It's the Lord's church. May he be glorified because he's building something. He's enacting his workmanship in us. We are God's workmanship, his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that we do, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We've looked back over 50 years and all, and we've seen, and as, as older pastors or previous pastors, we, we see the wonderful things that have been done here. We've given God the glory for them. Did you know God had that planned even before Trinity started? Planned the good works for us to do. So the 50 years that have gone by, what is taking place here and now, and what lies ahead for this part of the body known as Trinity, it is all about the Lord who has fashioned his people to be his chosen dwelling place by his Holy Spirit. What an amazing work of grace. For the creator of the universe to come and dwell in loving forgiveness, intentionally coming in Christ, coming to quirky, story-filled congregations with lousy pastors, whatever it might be, that God still comes. And he uses that odd and unique relationship to bring more of his light into a present dark world. May Jesus be praised. Amen.